My name is Greg Ryman. I'm the Vice Provost for Lehigh University's Library and Technology Services. This is a unit that includes our libraries, our Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning, and a broad range of technologies that we support across the university. I also teach when I'm able in the Department of Philosophy. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce our event, which is a conversation with Professor Osagi Obasagi on bioethics, race, and health. I'll say a few more words about uh, Dr. Opasagi in a moment when I introduce him and uh, his interlocutor tonight, Professor Fatima Wakil. But first I'd like to note that today's conversation was sponsored by the Friends of the Lehigh Libraries, which is a wonderful group that since 1980 has been dedicated to enhancing our services and supporting talks like the one tonight. Uh, we're always up to good things in the Lehigh Libraries and the Friends are always there to help us do what we um, value so highly. So thank you to the Friends and especially to our board who recommended Dr. Obasagi is a wonderful speaker and who invited him to Lehigh. If you're interested in becoming a friend of the libraries, I encourage you to do so, look into it. It's a wonderful group with an important mission. We host a lot of um, events um, now virtual, but soon enough, we'll get back to hosting them in our, in our beautiful libraries at Lehigh. The friends asked if I could introduce the speakers and it's my honor to do so, I think for two reasons, uh, probably more than that, but two I'll touch on. First is that for over a year now, the kind of thinking that we've all been asked to do individually and collectively as we have navigated this pandemic has been informed as much by the humanities and social sciences as it, is, as it has been by medicine, basic science and politics. Each day as we make choices, we are each of us applied bioethicists. And as an expert on that topic, Dr. Obasagi is, the, is in an ideal position to help us think more deeply, clearly and broadly on topics that we're all wrestling with every day. Second, Recent examples of police violence to, you know, all over the news even today, nearly every day, has deepened our collective awareness of the fact that how we live our lives, how we understand our world, how we're treated and how we treat one another is, is shaped by issues of race. This is another area of Dr. Obasagi's research as his scholarly expertise ranges over constitutional law, policing and police use of force, sociology of law, race and inequality in law and medicine. We are lucky to have him here with us tonight to help us learn more about these crucial matters that lie at the intersection of bioethics, race, and health. We say just a few more words by way of introduction. Uh, Dr. Obasagi is the Haas Distinguished Chair and Professor of Bioethics at the University of California, Berkeley. He's in the Joint Medical Program and School of Public Health. His writings have spanned both academic and public audiences with articles appearing in prestigious publications, too many to list here tonight. Uh, but he has also published three books, First, Blinded by Sight, Seeing Race Through the Eyes of the Blind, Beyond Bioethics, Towards a Biopolitics, sorry, Towards a New Biopolitics, and most recently, Trumpism and Its Discontent. He received his BA in Sociology and Political Science from, from Yale University, his JD from Columbia Law School, and his PhD in Sociology from the University of California at Berkeley. Our format tonight is a conversation, and I'm delighted to introduce our conversationalist, uh, Dr. Obasagi's conversational partner will be Dr. Fatima Wakil. Dr. Wakil is an associate professor and director of graduate programs at Lehigh University's College of Health. The goal of her research agenda is to produce knowledge that will help reduce racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in adverse maternal and child health out outcomes. Thank you both for being here today. It's such an honor to be in your presence and to hear uh, your conversation. Uh, Fatima, in a moment, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, but first, let me say to our audience that if you have uh, uh, questions for either uh, Dr. Obasaki or for Dr. Uh, Wakil, please post them in the Q&A. Um, our, our format will, will proceed for about 45 minutes of conversation, um, and then we'll turn to the Q&A and I'll facilitate at that point. So uh, Fatima, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Obasaki. It's such an honor and privilege to learn more about you and your work. Um, so I'd like to kick things off by just asking you, um, can you tell us and uh, begin telling us about how you got into the field of bioethics? What really drew you to this discipline? Yeah, so, so thank you. And it's really glad to be here virtually with you. Um, I wish I could be there in person, um, but as we all know, the public health circumstances don't allow that quite yet. We're almost there, um, but I hope to be able to visit the campus uh, soon. Um, so how did I get into, into, into bioethics? Um, so I think it's, I can answer that question by st starting by talking about some of the distinctions between medical ethics on the one hand and bioethics on the other hand. So I don't mean to, to draw any hard and fast lines between those two fields, but it's important to understand kind of their different uh, emphasis. So 
medical ethics is an idea and a practice that's been around for hundreds of years. You can think of like the Hippocratic Oath. And it's mostly a field that's really dedicated to understanding how individual doctors think about the ethics of their practice, how they treat their patients, bedside manner, um, what to do in certain situations. And it's really been a field that's mostly about training uh, individual physicians to do what they think is the right thing. Um, steeped a lot in theology, um, kind of a Christian thought, other Western um, um, thoughts, philosophy, and has that really kind of individual kind of um, professional uh, ethics behind it. So bioethics as a field is much more recent. And it, it, as a field, it, uh, many scholars think of it as emerging out of the Holocaust, right? So this moment where um, in contrast to medical ethics, where medical ethics really trusts the professional to do the right thing, the Holocaust was this moment where we saw physicians and scientists engaging in behaviors that were horrifically bad and, and, and remarkably against the principles of the field. And the field of bioethics emerged out of that moment to say, you know what, there are, we can now have a strong evidence that physicians and scientists simply can't be trusted to do, the right, to do the right thing all the time. And so we need a new field with perhaps a new professional, the bioethicist, to assist in thinking through what are the appropriate steps and moreover, to think in a much more regulatory sense about how we kind of oversee the development of new technologies and new practices. And so if we think about bioethics emerging out of that particular moment in history um, where we saw horrific crimes being perpetrated against vulnerable populations, we can think of bioethics having a much more stronger emphasis of understanding the role between the state and vulnerable people, right? Um, and how science and technology can be weaponized in a way that can be quite harmful to the most vulnerable populations. And bioethics as kind of coming in to try to uh, see itself as the field that can be a protector, right? And so those are very noble origins. And I, I'm, I was very interested in kind of how the field of bioethics kind of emerged uh, as this opportunity to provide that type of oversight for a professional field that quite frankly had you know, lost, I don't wanna say lost credibility, but in that post-World War II moment, we just realized just, uh, how uh, the healing profession, quote unquote, can be used to do, to do things that were just quite harmful and quite destructive. However, we fast, so, and so the field of bioethics, again, it was a slow conversation emerging out of the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, at the same time, we had this kind of recognition of the harms that uh, scientists and physicians, physicians could do. We also had remarkable technological innovations in the 70s and 80s um, with regard to things like uh, understanding brain death, uh, organ transplantation, things of that nature, which raised new questions about what is the appropriate role of physicians in science to kind of engage in kind of these questions, what, what people call playing God, right? And so we needed someone to, uh, a, a separate professional to think through those issues. We also, if you get into the late 70s and early 80s, um, had new questions about human subjects research. So for example, this is the, the revelation of Tuskegee and how um, researchers who are part of the US Public Health Service were engaged in questionable and uh, unethical practices with regards to quote unquote treating syphilis in African American populations. So that blew up around the same time. And so all these events kind of congealed to kind of give the field of bioethics uh, a founding or, or kind of a, a backbone or, or a foundation um, to really think about these broader questions about providing some type of oversight uh, of science and medicine, particularly uh, in those situations where large institutions or government uh, actors are, are doing things that can harm um, not only vulnerable populations, but particularly at moments, racial populations in particular, uh, uh, Racial populations in particular, I should say. Um, so for me, as, as a young scholar, this is a fascinating history. Um, what I find particularly interesting is how the field of bioethics in its contemporary iteration has deviated from this, this, its origins in terms of understanding its role. So you can, so if you think of bioethics as having this role or this origins of protecting vulnerable populations, Contemporary bioethics often doesn't see itself that way. It, see, it often sees itself as more aligned with, uh, with industry. Uh, so medicine as an industry or research as an industry. Uh, we see so many of the, of the conversations around bioethics uh, kind of just focusing on these kind of technical questions, uh, these questions of how do we allow researchers to do the work that they wanna do, as opposed to how do we make sure that the most vulnerable aren't harmed. And so there's just been this remarkable shift in the field 
um, that has caught my attention. And I think there's an opportunity to bring bioethics as a field back to where it was in this kind of post-World War, World War II moment, which was how do we have greater oversight and make sure that the most dispossessed people aren't further harmed by science and medicine, which are fields which are supposed to improve people's lives, not further damage them. So a lot of my work has been engaged in that endeavor and thinking more critically about how new technological innovations such as uh, stem cell research or assisted reproduction or CRISPR-Cas9 germline engineering, how can we think about regulating these new technologies in the spirit of what bioethics was supposed to be, which was how do we kind of maximize these technologies so that they can help the most people and harm the fewest. Um, and so that's how I think about the field and how I became interested in it. That's wonderful. Thank you. It, it's so interesting how you said, you know, bringing it back to the way it was in post-World War II. That's very interesting. And I'm going to ask you to expand on that a little. Um, so you've written a number of articles and books that encompass topics such as bioethics, race, and health. Uh, your first book was titled Blinded by Sight, Seeing Race Through the Eyes of the Blind. So in this book, you discuss how attempting to apply this notion of color blindness in institutions such as law, public policy, and culture will not result in a racial utopia. Can you expand on this a little, please? Yes, yes. So, um, so I've been just fascinated by um, how the idea of color blindness has become particularly attractive over the past few decades as a way to resolve racial tension. And the basic idea behind colorblindness as a metaphor in law and public policy is this idea of if we simply don't pay attention to race, if we're quote unquote blind to race, that will ensure some level of neutrality, particularly at the government level. And that type of neutrality with regards to how we treat people and how we kind of divide up resources will necessarily lead to a just world. That is by simply being blind to how people physically appear or blind to other types of differences, that means that justice will follow. And um, it's, it's an idea that is kind of um, steeped into this idea that, uh, or it's, it's an idea that's, that's kind of premised upon this notion that being in a tenth race is what can lead to better or just outcomes. Um, and it's a uh, it, it's it, the metaphor of colorblindness uh, is uh, kind of the what's at the foundation of the metaphor is this notion of that uh, not being able to see race uh, and, and in particular in this situation people who are blind they have it's, it's an assumption that uh, that they have a experience in the world that is necessarily a just one so it, it's a metaphor that is premised upon the idea that blind people because they can't see race. Are, uh, are by definition uh, the kind of the, the best people out there with regards to uh, race and racial justice. Uh, simply because they can't see race, it's, it's presumed that they treat everyone fairly and equitably. And colorblindness as a metaphor works from that assumption to make a proposal about how society ought to go about its work. That is by being blind to these, to these differences, it too can be, can be just. And so, that idea and that metaphor and that assumption about how a particular group of people uh, experience the world always troubled me. Um, and it came to a head uh, uh, when I was in grad school. I was, um, I was watching uh, television late at night and the movie Ray came on. And I was fascinated by the life experiences of Ray Charles. So Ray Charles, a musician, um, who died a few years ago, a uh, uh, rhythm and blues musician, trem tremendously talented. Uh, he was someone who went blind very early in life. And the, as the movie portrays it, he's someone, um, and he's a, he was an African-American, he is someone um, whose uh, race and ideas of race shaped so much of his, of his life experience. And so that gets kind of triggered me like, huh, so this is interesting. We have someone who's been blind for most of their life, yet they have a deeply kind of, um, uh, they have a deep sense of what race is in the world. And so it, it caught my attention. I was like, well, let's, let's, let's explore this. So like any good social scientist, I, I, uh, I, I conducted a study. And I, sh I should take a step back. So when I first saw the movie, I, I assumed that this question had been asked before. I guess assumed that there have been all these studies around blind people's understanding of race. Um, and so I spent several weeks just kind of looking, you know, doing my my, my, uh, my dutiful literature review, trying to figure out who's done this work. And I was just surprised that no one in the scholarly literature has simply asked this question. 
how do blind people understand race? It seems like a very simple question, but it hadn't been part of the literature, in part because as a society, we have this deep kind of assumption that because blind people can't see, that race is not, is not important to them. So that's when I started my research, and, uh, and I interviewed uh, 100 people uh, for the book, um, over 100 people who have been totally blind since birth, and just asked them, what is race? How has race impacted your life? And what I found is that blind people understand race just like anyone else. So blind people say that race is physical features, it's skin color, it's facial shapes, it's hair texture. And it really, uh, what this show, uh, the extent to which race is a social phenomenon, not a visual phenomenon, um, it showed the extent to which our racial uh, uh, sensibilities are shaped by, so by, by social interactions in terms of how we're socialized to see race in certain ways and how that socialization uh, process can be so strong that even blind people, in a sense, come to see race. Um, and so what the book does is really highlight the fact that um, not, it's not simply this idea that blind people understand race, but it's really an opportunity to show that the ability to see race is that social, so it's, it's a function of social practices and that we have to think about that as being the kind of crux of where race and racism come from, rather than any kind of neutral engagement with racial difference that somehow imprints itself on us and leads people to behave in certain ways. Um, and so this empirical data, this qualitative data with regards to how blind people understand race, and I then use that information in the book to then destabilize the metaphor of colorblindness, right? Because once you have this kind of information showing that blind people understand race, just like sighted people, and that the common shared experience of being socialized to see race certain ways kind of makes those, those uh, experiences, you know, quite similar, that then kind of undermines the idea of colorblindness, that the idea that, of simply being inattentive to race or being blind to race will naturally lead to a some type of fair and equitable um, outcome. And it also implores us to take a much more active role in being anti-racist in our public uh, policy and legal actions. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to ask, I'll extend this a little bit further. Is colorblindness an issue in medicine and scientific research? For example, when we think about, you know, COVID vaccination distribution among communities of color. Yeah, so in medicine, the uh, issue of race plays out a bit differently. It's, so colorblindness is an issue to the extent that it kind of, it's at the foundation of what we, what I call a misattribution of the significance of race. So in medicine, there is a tendency to think about race as a biological or, 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 or as I said, as a function of biological differences, right? So medicine, uh, unfortunately, is still working in this kind of world that is, uh, that is in a sense, pre-social construction. That is that, you know, as social folks in social sciences and humanities, we tend to think about race as a social construction. That is, race is a function of these kind of social, political, and economic practices. It's not a real or tangible or biological entity, rather it's a, it's a, it's a product of our social interactions. Um, so that's how we think about things in the humanities and social sciences. In medicine and many aspects of the life sciences, much of that research is still engaged in these conversations about race reflecting biological differences that can be seen at, at almost this kind of genetic or molecular level. And so <clears throat> in that sense, uh, you know, uh, medicine has um, it's tend it has tended to kind of treat race as if it is a real entity in ways that are quite complicated and difficult. And at the same time, it has obscured the role of social and political factors in shaping the significance of race. So that is to say that while uh, much of the conversation in medicine is about race and biology, it has in a sense kind of not been attentive to how kind of social and political practices affect the outcomes of minority groups in particular, or how it has, in a sense, um, um, not only it, it, in fact the outcomes, but has produced the very health disparities that are often soon to be uh, kind of inherent to racial groups themselves. So, you know, so this is less a conversation about medicine being blind to race and more of a conversation about it kind of overemphasizing the idea of racial biology and misattributing the significance of race to some type of biological difference 
as opposed to what often is the core driver of racial disparities, which is simply how we treat one another. And so a lot of my work is trying to encourage folks in medicine and science to be more attentive to these kind of social, political, and environmental um, drivers of racial inequalities in medicine, rather than assuming that people of color in particular are sicker or fare worse simply because that's the way they are. And we have to get away from that troubling understanding of race and try to have this more, I think, relevant contextual understanding of racial disparities in health. Absolutely. Um, so one more question about colorblindness. Um, sure. Can you please discuss how the concept of colorblindness then translates to the criminal justice system? Yeah, so uh, these are all such great questions. <laughs> so in the criminal justice system, the colorblindness becomes relevant to the extent that many actors in the criminal justice system assume that criminal justice enacts itself in a fair and neutral, neutral way. So for example, uh, none of our criminal laws uh, actively or explicitly take race into consideration. So none of the criminal laws are written, say, you know, you have to patrol black communities in a certain way. Um, they don't explicitly say, you know, you have to privilege white communities in a certain way, right? So there's this idea that because the criminal law is facially neutral, right, it is in a sense blind to any type of, I should say, put blind in quotes, it's not, or say it's not attentive to race, it simply follows the law and that the law itself treats all people equally. Well, we all know that that's not true, right? Um, and we all know that, that many minority communities uh, are much more burdened by the criminal justice system than white communities. So we have to uh, be mindful of how this idea of neutrality, this idea of facial neutrality in law uh, plays itself out on the ground as a form of inequality um, to communities of color and understand how neutral laws can be, um, can be uh, in a sense, enacted in a way that are quite harmful and devastating to communities of color. And that's a very tricky process. And it's a process that a lot of my work focuses on, which is how do these kind of neutral practices, these kind of even-handed practices, um, ultimately become weapons to destroy minority, com uh, minority communities? And that often comes down to, you know, practices, customs, institutions, and how these um, uh, assumptions, assumptions about how certain communities should be surveilled translates into new ways and technologies of, uh, of oppressing minority communities. And so we have to get, be mindful of how all of this is facilitated by a series of laws that on their face appear to be equal and, and fair and just, but in reality are quite or anything but that. Yeah, so I, that's wonderful. So I actually have a follow-up question to that. Um, so do you have any recommendations for you know people working in the legal system or criminal justice system to, you know, to not do exactly what you just said, what you've just described? Yeah, yeah. So I think the, the main thing is to understand that all of the poor outcomes that we see coming out of the criminal justice system in terms of racial disparities, in terms of who's impacted, in terms of which neighborhoods get, um, get destroyed um, by policing. We have to understand that as an intended function of how policing operates. That is to say that it's a feature and not a bug. Um, and we have to understand what these are, the relationship between these contemporary practices and this long legacy of racial violence um, that policing and other forms of state control have done in order to ensure that communities of color are in a sense kept under, under control. Um, I think it's, it's tempting to think about issues around policing in a snapshot. That is, it's tempting um, to simply kind of go out into the world and say, oh, this community looks kind of rough. We need to kind of make sure there's some law and order without putting that, con that contemporary moment in, in a broader context and a broader history both in terms of the resources that have been taken out of certain communities, the lack of opportunity for these communities to have self-improvement, and the long legacy of political and social disenfranchisement that produces these outcomes in certain communities. And once you have that longer vision, um, we can then think about other ways for community improvement outside of a strong police presence. And so I, for those who are working in this area, I really encourage folks to think more broadly and deeply and to situate uh, where communities are in its deeper context as we think about ways to help folks um, you know, improve their lives. Wonderful, that's, that's wonderful, thank you.
Um, so now I'd like to ask you about your second book. Uh, so your second book is titled Beyond Bioethics Towards a New Geo uh, Biopolitics. Mm -hmm. So in this book, you discuss the fact that the field of bioethics is largely focused on ethical issues surrounding individual level decision-making and has really neglected to address the broader social and political impacts of new biotechnologies, such as assisted reproduction, um, human gene modification, and DNA forensics. So can you please expand on this? And what are some of the political and social issues we need to consider as we develop these biotechnologies? Yeah, this is really the, the key problem um, with the field of bioethics. And so, you know, as I discussed a, a, a bit earlier, you know, the field of bioethics emerged to tackle these broader social problems, these kind of deeper uh, issues between the state and vulnerable populations and providing some level of protection. And you look at where the field is now, and it's largely engaged in, in what, you know, I would characterize as these kind of individual con consultations, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are the, what's the ethical choice that should be done uh, for a particular patient? Um, how do we, uh, how do, how do we think about human subject protections in particular research projects? And the field of bioethics has become quite limited, um, which has, in a sense, um, you know, it, it has, uh, it, it certainly pivoted the conversation away from what was intended to something that is much more disempowered, much more um, episodic um, in terms of uh, thinking about how to make decisions with regards to individual transactions that happen in the field of medicine, rather than thinking about structural transformations that are needed within the field of science and medicine. Um, and so, um, what a lot of my work has tried to do is to try to make bioethics part of a broader conversation around democracy. That is, in order for us to have a truly um, engaged and uh, relevant democracy, we have to have the public participate in these big questions of science and medicine in terms of how we move forward. Um, mm -hmm. And I see myself as a scholar as participating in the process of doing the translational work that is needed to make the, the discussions and the kind of uh, the controversies that are happening in science accessible to a broader public so that people can chime in and be part of the process of making decisions about how we move forward. So, so much of the conversation in science and medicine is often one that focuses on how these topics are so complicated that we can only have specialists and experts weigh in on what we should do rather than finding ways to make those, 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 those ideas and controversies accessible to a public so that public can then understand what's going on and allow broader democratic values and sentiments be part of the decision-making process. So one example is um, the idea or the, the, the technology of CRISPR-Cas9 germline engineering that um, is emerging as a new technology that acts as a form of what they describe as genetic scissors that can, at the molecular level, go in and kind of make deletions or make certain insertions to, to affect the genetic code um, of certain individuals that can, that can possibly treat inheritable diseases and do it in a way that not only affects the person that you're operating on, but uh, when it's done in a germline capacity, it could then affect all subsequent generations, right? So in theory, you could eradicate heritable diseases across many generations, right? So in, at some level, that seems like a win-win a for everyone, right? On the other hand, there's a, there's a potential here for a new form of eugenics. If these types of germline interventions are done in a way to weed out certain populations that are deemed to be less than worthy. And we have a long history um, in our society around eugenics. Um, eugenics was not just something that happened in Europe in the 1930s and 40s, rather it was inspired by many scientists and philanthropists and other folks in, in the United States um, and it, in, in medical and scientific communities here. And so there, that eugenic temptation has been with us for so long. And in many ways, a technology like CRISPR-Cas9 is the dream tool for, to fulfill those eugenic aspirations. So we have to be very careful about how this technology moves forward. Um, and again, you know, the question of, of whether or not CRISPR should ever be used, it's much more uh, than a simple question of what an individual patient wants, right? Because the idea of being able to use, use this technology in these particular ways impacts our society. So as, as a scholar, I see my work um, as 
how do we kind of take this controversy around CRISPR-Cas9 and talk about it to a broader public so that they understand what's at stake, they understand what's positive about this technology and what are some of the possible adverse consequences. And then we have a much more robust democratic conversation about how we as a society wanna move forward. And I think the public is certainly capable of, of engaging in that process and having a meaningful conversation. And I think that conversation and the values that come out of it can go a long way in informing how this technology moves forward. Absolutely. So now I have a question about um, my field, which is public and population health research. Mm -hmm. Um, those of us in these fields, we generally really pride ourselves on being proponents of social justice, and we have a strong passion for promoting health equity. Can you please discuss some of the ethical pitfalls that researchers may fall into, even while having the best of intentions, especially when it comes to working with vulnerable and populations and communities of color? Yes, yes. So it's, it's a tough one. So I'll start by saying that my training is, uh, is in law and in sociology. So I have a JD and a PhD. I currently find myself uh, on the faculty of a school of public health and a medical program. So I teach medical students and public health students. So this is to say that um, in the you know, past four or five years in which I've been in the field of public health, um, I've been really interested in how good intentions can lead to bad outcomes. Um, and I think public health uh, really struggles with that. Um, that is to say that the field of public health is one where uh, it's trying to understand the health conversation as something that's much bigger than the individual kind of medical condition of someone and understanding how health can be impacted by broader structural and environmental outcomes, right? Um, so that's where we talk about things such as the social and political determinants of health. Um, we under, and we, in particular, in this kind of COVID-19 moment, um, public health has had a hard time articulating the importance of taking this kind of public health and population health perspective to combating a pandemic because so many people continue to think about their health as an individual um, uh, series of, of, of decisions that they have to make, right? So it's my decision whether I should wear a mask. It's my decision about whether I need to get vaccinated. It's my decision about whether I need to socially distance or take other precautions. And, you know, for the most part, Americans have a hard time of understanding what public health means, right? And they have a hard time of, say, of understanding how in taking individual actions is not simply about your health, it's about protecting those around you, right? So wearing a mask, it's about making sure that you don't inadvertently spread a disease to other people. Um, and, um, and so I think public health has had a hard time um, communicating that to, to the public. And I think it's come to, um, it's something that's been kind of highlighted in the most recent moments. I think where public health sometimes um, gets itself in trouble is that at, there are moments where it can become a bit deterministic in understanding the role of, of, of social and environmental determinants in producing health outcomes. And um, I, I think it uh, often struggles to have an understanding of the interaction between individual agency and social structure. Um, and, um, and so I, I think the field needs to kind of um, think more broadly about that, those dynamics and to develop ways of understanding how certain populations, in particular racial, racial minorities, um, can at once be subjected to various social and political and environmental um, uh, um, kind of um, problems or contaminants, yet at the same time thrive in the face of that through certain types of individual cultural actions and creating space for, for that in a way that is nuanced and doesn't kind of, uh, kind of relegate all populations that are subjected to these to these kind of contaminants to having particularly detrimental bad outcomes, and so and I think you see some of this already occurring, um, um, and you see some of the, some of the kind of new sets of research really kind of emphasizing what does it mean to be resilient, right, and what does it mean for for folks to again continue to do well in the face of all this, and so I think that part of the public health agenda I think is promising, and we just need to continue to you know. Uh, the research that um, highlights these dynamics. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I can definitely relate to so much of what you said.
um, being from the field of population health. I do have another question from the realm of population health. Um, so decisions about community level resource allocation of health and human services are often made really by high ranking community officials. What are some of the ethical issues to consider here? And what do you think are some of the, um, what do you think um, about some stakeholders who's in you know, the community stakeholders whose voices are not heard during the decision making processes process? Do you think that this often occurs? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I think this is a, a, a very, um, it's a problem that public health has at once been an innovator in trying to resolve in terms of the relationship between um, community stakeholders and, uh, and uh, you know, public officials. Um, and so public health has, you know, at once been innovative and on the other hand, been criticized for some of those innovations. And I'm thinking here in particular, the role of community-based participatory research. Um, and so a lot of my colleagues at Berkeley were, have been involved in that. And it's a, it's a practice that has been trying to normalize the idea that when scholars or state actors go into communities to do research, that that research should be informed, quote unquote, from the bottom up, from the very community members who are being affected. And so that it has been, I think, a, I think a, a revolutionary way of thinking about public health, the idea that expertise should not exist in a silo and that expertise is always in partnership with community members and that community members should, um, should uh, you know, be seen as, as equal, equal partners in that, in that process. Um, however, some folks have been critical of community-based participatory research as not, not delivering on what it promises. And in particular, for example, going into communities, uh, obtaining research and data. Um, and then, you know, there are folks who said that, you know, the process of making sure that that information is then um, kind of given back to the community in a way that that uh, positively impacts their lives, that, that that process is not always completed. And oftentimes community members feel like uh, they are not, uh, that their life experiences and expertise at the community level is often uh, exploited by scholars to fulfill their research interests and agendas, but not been used to uh, transform the lives of the very people who provide that information. And so I think, you know, public health would be more attentive to making sure that when we engage in that public health research that we're completing the loop and that we are not only, you know, improving research outcomes, but we're also making sure that we're doing this work for a specific purpose of improving the life, the lives of those people that we are engaging with. Um, you know, one thing that I, I've been particularly concerned about is the kind of what seems like the never ending and relentless research around health disparities. Um, that is to say that we see countless uh, research efforts in trying to measure and assess health disparities. So what I mean by that are differential health outcomes uh, stratified by racial group. Um, and so we see people over and over and over again, measuring these differences and publishing papers on these differences across all types of health outcomes. But then we see fewer um, opportunities to, in a sense, intervene to change those outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that is to say that um, many of, you know, many academics have built careers off of measuring these differences. Um, and, it, you know, I would say that there's an argument to be made that uh, we no longer need to measure these health disparities because we all know what they are and, and what the, why they're there. Um, we need to kind of move to a second phase of research, which is like, how do we kind of fix things? And unfortunately, you know, so much of the health disparities conversation is still in that measuring um, phase of things. And we're committing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every year to measuring differential outcomes. And we get it. People mm -hmm. of color often don't do as well as other folks. Like that's been established, right? How do we leverage those resources that are available, not to simply measuring these differences, but how do we use it to fix the problem and to make sure folks are, 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 in, are in a better position? And I would, I would like to see this, the field of public health use those resources and that knowledge to be more um, involved and engaged in developing interventions rather than simply documenting what we already know. Absolutely, definitely. Uh, there needs to be a paradigm shift from the sort of determinants of health and then the implement to really implementation science, right? To really make sure that we're informing programs and policies and working very closely with communities to make to bring about change. Absolutely. Right. right. Um, so I have one last question that I brought with me today, and then we'll certainly you know open it up to the audience. Um, so I know that we have a lot of students in the audience today. 
So what are some words of advice you would give students in different disciplines about incorporating bioethics in their respective careers? Yeah, yeah, um, great question. So I, um, what I always tell, so I teach bioethics um, on campus um, and my class all, you know, typically has folks from all types of different disciplines. So right now I'm teaching a seminar on bioethics I have about 20 students from eight or nine different um, departments and programs. So everything from, from law and medicine to plant biology to sociology to all types of disciplines, right? And what I tell my students is that no matter what profession you end up going in, bioethics is gonna be a part of it, right? Because the issue, science, medicine, and technology are becoming such a tremendous part of our, of our kind of daily lives. And if you're going to become a lawyer, you're going to deal with, you're going to deal probably with ethical issues around, for example, if, if you're doing family law, questions around assisted reproduction are going to come up. Um, and if you're doing work um, as a criminal lawyer, questions around DNA databases and criminal forensics are going to come up. Um, if you're going to be a sociologist, clearly issues around science and technology will be, will be a part of your work. And so this is to say that bioethics, in my mind, is foundational to what it means to be a professional in the 21st century. And so I would encourage folks to try to get a solid understanding of what the field is and how we think through problems, um, understanding its historical context, understanding, you know, I, I take the radical position that bioethics is fundamentally at its core an effort, an effort at anti-eugenics. So if you understand the field as emerging out of this post-World War II moment where we realize that science and technology um, that those professionals can't necessarily be trusted to always do the right thing and that bioethics is, is trying to add another voice. That is fundamentally a voice that is critical of the eugenic practices that folks were engaged in before World War II. And more importantly, the existence of bioethics or the emergence of bioethics after the war is a commitment to never ever go back down that field, right? Now, this is not how the field can, uh, understands itself now. And I see my work as trying to get the field to understand those anti-eugenic roots. But this is to say that the question of eugenics and the specter of a new form of eugenics is emerging in so many different fields right now. And I really wanna encourage folks to take that seriously, to understand kind of what eugenics was as a moment in history um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s where society was actively engaged in a project of using science and technology to in a sense weed out and eliminate certain types of people that were thought to be uh, non-productive in society and to promote and privilege those populations that it thought to be biologically superior, right? So this was an active moment of using these technologies in a way, again, to eliminate some people and to uh, uplift others, right? Mm -hmm. and we can, and that idea is still with us to this very day. So, you know, one thing we could, one thing we talk about later on is that um, I led an effort um, uh, over the past couple of years to both um, identify and get rid of a research fund that was at Berkeley School of Public Health. It was a two and a half million dollar research fund that was there, had been there for 40 years to support eugenics research. And that was a research fund that was brought to the school in the 1970s. So, you know, after World War II, in part because this idea of eugenics persisted after the war and many scientists and many philanthropists still thought that scientists and physicians could play a key role in using their professional skill set to again identify certain weak populations that should be you know again um, in a sense kind of uh, kept out or kept away from thriving or you know or this or or in a sense you know uh, I should say that uh, the idea of identifying those populations that were thought of, again, as non-productive and promoting the health and well-being of those that are, are um, welcome. So this is to say that eugenics has never quite gone away, um, that we're still engaging in these conversations, um, that there is still a thread of research within science and medicine that is actively pursuing eugenic ends. And as we develop a new generation of professionals who are going out into the world, we have to have our minds attuned to that. And so I see bioethics as an opportunity of understanding that history, understanding kind of the role of being sensitive to that history and a commitment to it not ever happening again. And what does it mean to understand that in your professional workspace, again, whether you're a lawyer, a sociologist, someone in the humanities, being, being sensitive to that, 
being able to educate the people around you about this history and making sure that when these ideas kind of percolate up in your workspace, that you're able to identify it and push back to make sure that we are actually creating a space around us that is truly uh, inclusive and celebrates human diversity. Um, and so I think that's the challenge of this, at least this early part of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know we have a lot of work to do um, because uh, this idea of, of eugenics is quite insidious. It kind of, it comes up in moments that we don't quite always expect it to, right? So I, I never expected I never expected that in my workplace, I would confront a eugenics research fund that had been kind of sitting around for four decades, right? Um, but when we see it and we, when we identify it, we have to take, take action because again, we can't let that moment in human history ever resuscitate and become part of, of, of our daily practices. Absolutely, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you today and I look forward to um, your further conversation. Sure. I'll give it back to Greg. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Everything so far has been, uh, I'm, I think I speak for all of our audience when I say uh, thought provoking and, uh, and engaging. So thank you for everything you've said so far. Um, a couple of questions are rolling in, but I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, exert my role here and, and ask the first question of you, if I, if I may. I'm, and it's really a follow up to uh, Dr. Wakil's uh, last question, which is um, thinking about, you know, students, but also colleagues and, um, and friends, family. Um, I think, those of us who teach and think in these spaces have found ourselves in a funny position where our our academic work is, you know, colliding with day-to-day -day decisions and the impact of COVID or the, uh, you know, uh, instances of police brutality on the streets and the, the different ways in which it's it's not just a theoretical enterprise. I mean, in some ways, it's never just a theoretical enterprise, but it, it feels like in some ways the reality of how it's hitting our students and our communities um, is is much stronger in 2020 than, than it may have been before. Um, it doesn't take an active imagination for our students to see the deep relevance of the topics you're talking about. Um, and so in, in responding to uh, Dr. Wakil's question about um, advice to students, you, you focus on uh, the professional, the importance of thinking about bioethics in the profession. Can you say a little bit more about, about um, how this has, um, you know, uh, how this has translated into, um, uh, uh, I guess an individual impact on your students or, or, or on colleagues or others and, and how you've used your uh, years of thinking about these questions to guide thinking, uh, I guess, thinking through the pandemic and, uh, and all the different ethical questions that have arisen in the last, you know, uh, I guess maybe most sharply in the last uh, uh, month for us. Yeah, so this is really uh, another really important and interesting question. Um, so I have, um, the way I've talked about this with some of my students is to kind of use this moment as a way to understand the importance of institutions. You know, particularly in this kind of neoliberal world, we tend to focus on individuals as a kind of key point of agency. And, you know, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is how we have started to embrace kind of this idea of anti-racism as the kind of the way to solve all these problems. And so, I, when I use anti-racism in this sense, I'm talking about this idea of kind of individual transformation. That is the idea that individuals themselves should kind of transform the way they think about the world and that the series of kind of individual engagements that can lead individuals to kind of rethink the way they approach things will somehow bubble up and have this kind of social transformation. Now, clearly and obviously, anti-racism is an important uh, aspect of how we should all develop and evolve as human individuals. We should all constantly have these conversations with ourselves and with those around us about how can we go through the world in a way that not only promotes anti-racism, but also finds other ways to make sure that we have the most diverse community possible. Okay, period. And <laughs> we have to understand how the problems that we see in the world, such as an officer putting his knee on the neck of an individual for nine minutes um, until he dies, uh, and other forms of police brutality, that this is not simply about individual bad actors. It's about a social structure in an institution that permits that, right? So when we look at the video of Derek Chauvin and George Floyd, we see an individual with his hands in his pocket and smirking on his face as he kills someone, and it's not simply that this is an individual bad officer, but this is an officer who exists within a social structure that refuses to hold police accountable when they do bad things. So in that moment, 
uh, Derek Chauvin is not afraid of any consequence that might occur because we have seen time and time again where police officers have engaged in horrific behavior and not be held accountable. And as you see this trial unfold right now, um, as, as, as it's going on right now, you know, Derek Chauvin is making a bet that he will not be convicted of any crime because, and again, history is unfortunately on his side. Um, and that is a social problem, and that's an institutional problem, and that's a legal problem, right? And no amount of anti-racism at an individual level is going to solve that broader institutional problem. And so this is to say that, you know, as, as students start to think about these problems that we're seeing around us, we have to think about not simply how to transform individuals, but how do we rethink the very institutions that are perpetuating these harms on people, right? We need to complement this anti-racist moment, which again is necessary, but not sufficient in doing the complete work that we need to have a society that truly you know, respects uh, everyone's dignity. Incredibly helpful, thank you. I um, appreciate the, the thorough answer. Get lots, more to, lots more to think about as well as we go along here. I'm gonna to turn to our list of questions from the Q&A forum over, over on the side. And um, I'm gonna start with two that kind of go together. Um, I think they're both referring to the, uh, the, some of your observations about um, differential health outcomes in communities of color. And um, if I recall correctly, you, you, had, you made the comment that we don't need to keep studying this because we kind of know that there's a differential impact um, so the, the, the question, first question was, um, I guess a practical one, what, what lessons have, given that there's been a differential impact, especially uh, around COVID-19 on communities of color, um, what lessons do you think we ought to learn to keep that from happening again? What, if, you know, what, what, what steps should we do differently now? And then secondly, is there still a role for that kind of research um, in order to try to track uh, progress being made um, it, it, uh, around um, any changes that we make that would have a, a, a more positive outcome? So there's yeah. kind of two parts of the question. Sure. Um, so great question. So I, I think you know um, I think it's important to realize that the idea that communities of color would be disproportionately burdened by a global pandemic was entirely predictable, um, and uh, it reflects the kind of social, political, and economic vulnerability of these of these communities, and so. Um, you know, if you think back to March and April last year, um, one thing that I was deeply disturbed by was the change in the public conversation and attitude towards COVID-19. Once the initial data came out showing that it was largely poor people of color who, that was harmed by the disease. Um, and once that data came out, all of a sudden that led to a political moment of reopen America, reopen the states, that we don't need to be as precautious, you don't need to wear a mask. And the undertone was this kind of eugenic sensibility that I was talking about earlier. That is to say that this is a disease that is burdening and wiping out populations that in a sense weren't seen as valuable. And so therefore we can just kind of let it run its course. And this is where we had these very disturbing public conversations about herd immunity in the context of just let this disease run its course, let it burn out, which was a not so hidden conversation of let this disease in a sense ravage its way through communities of color and then let it burn out. Don't We don't want to impact the economy. And so we'll just let it impact these communities while we go on and live our lives and make money. That was, and again, this was not implicit. This was not hidden. This was a very explicit conversation that was driven by the initial data of who was burdened by the disease. Um, so this is to say that, you know, whenever we see these type of these phenomena emerge, we, it's, it's A, quite predictable about who's going to be harmed by it. But it's also an opportunity for us to, in a sense, understand the extent to which uh, kind of, kind of uh, public health phenomenon are deeply intertwined with existing socioeconomic disparities and understanding that these health outcomes are so closely connected to how we organize the world in other ways. And so the next time, I, you know, I hope there is not a next time anytime soon, we face a crisis like this there's a real opportunity to get ahead um, and prevent the spread if we take these kind of social and political realities in mind and focus on resources on improving the public health infrastructure of certain communities to make sure that these that, that what are often the kind of uh, disproportionate exposure that communities of color have, which is tied to the type of jobs that people of color have, 
the fact that these are communities that often live in multi-generational households, um, often don't have the resources to, for example, um, be able to properly attend to like the spread of the disease or, or occupy jobs where if they do feel sick, they can't necessarily stay home, right? So if we know that those are the conditions that allow for a disease to spread and that it typically happens in certain communities, that's where we should put our resources, right? And, and we should put those resources there, not only in a moment of public health crisis, but in a moment where there is not a crisis as a kind of way to proactively get ahead to prevent the spread of these conditions. So this is to say that um, I, my hope is that the COVID-19 epidemic are, will allow us to think about what are the investments that we need to make in order to be able to structurally realign things so that we're in a better position to not only help society as a whole kind of survive this type of epidemic, but in particular to make sure that the most vulnerable are protected. And there's Thank a second you, part to your question. Yeah, you go can, ahead. Uh, can you remind me of the second part? Uh, it was just, I, I think it was, uh, is the research into differential health outcomes uh, mm -hmm. still important in that we'd like to track if, if uh, uh, interventions or changes to practice was, is having a positive impact? Uh, 100%, it's absolutely still important. We still need to be able to measure and understand which, which communities are, being, are having these kind of adverse impacts and understand the gap between racial minorities and other groups, um, it just can't simply be the only thing that we do, right? right? So we don't need to replicate these studies over and over and over again with regard to outcomes with cardiovascular disease or um, how um, communities living near environmental toxic dump sites uh, have poor respiratory outcomes. Like, we get it, we know it, it's bad, right? What are we gonna do about it? And often the question of what do we do about it is not simply about a specific public health intervention, but to making a certain demand and claim on the state that they simply cannot allow certain people to live this way because they are poor and brown, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where public health has to be a bit more activist and making sure that it's not simply seen as a tool of the state in measuring differences, but it's seen as a part of the state in making demands on behalf of communities to make sure that the state is invested in removing the conditions that creates these adverse health outcomes. Okay, thank you, that, that, that's very helpful. And, I, and I, I really appreciate how you just called attention to, you know, I, I think a lot of that sort of utilitarian thinking around, hey, this is how we're gonna get our way through this as long as this, this group or the other are, or the, you know, that, that they'll bear the burden for us. And that uh, I think has been deep, you know, again, as someone who teaches, teaches philosophy, that's sort of a you know, classic example of the um, potential disaster of that form of thinking. So uh, thanks for really, I mean, putting, uh, putting some stark detail on that. I think, I think you're right, hit the nail right on the head there. Um, Dr. Wakil, I know you also research in this area. Would you like to comment a bit on that as well? Sure, absolutely. So the idea here is not to take away from what we're already doing in terms of measuring these big, big important outcomes in terms of health disparities. There's a lot of national population-based studies that should continue you know, for example, the National Health and Nutrition Survey, things like that, that should always continue and really have provide us with information so that we can really document progress at the national level. We do, we do state assessments, we do community health needs assessments, those should all continue. The idea here is that we also need to really shift into more implementation science. And I do want to emphasize here that it's a science, that there's measurement involved when we when we work with the community and when we met, when we do these interventions it's we have to do very strict evaluations right so it's not just a mad, matter of doing interventions but also evaluating whether or not the intervention intervention worked and being very um, rigid about you know how are we measuring the process and outcomes and things like that so there is definitely measurement there it's just a matter of making sure that we're spending a little bit more time and effort and allocating our resources really to impacting the community more than just collecting information on the community. That's really helpful. Thanks for, I think that's a, a clarifying way to sort of step back and look at the, you know, these, these fields and how they operate. It's not really either or, right? The, the complementary work. And uh, we, we don't want to just sit back and study. We want to make, make a change in, in what we're doing there. Um, I'm going to shift to a, a slightly different question that came in. I think it's related. Um, but this is, again, it's a, a very, on the question of, of practical advice. Um, uh, so, the comment says a um, person works for and um, offers health services and uh, underserved largely minority population recently begun to weave social determinants of health into their service service plans. Wonder if you have suggestions for ways that you can best um, improve health outcome for the guests there. Um, and maybe just thinking a little bit more again, again, some pract practical advice for um, health practitioners on how to think about social determinants of health and intersection of, of um, those, those 
factors um, race and and um, uh, in, in in the applied setting. And I know you had commented earlier that um, a lot of cautionary notes around sort of using race as a proxy around um, I mean, you know, sort of uh, genetic assumptions and things like that. But um, I was wondering if you could maybe touch on both of those topics a little bit, the practical applications for, for folks who are out um, working in communities of color, um, and then also sort of uh, maybe say a bit more about your thinking about, you know, how, how some of your thinking about, um, about race um, can help, uh, help those who are working in medical fields um, sharpen their thinking as well. Yeah, sure. So this, um, this is a really important uh, issue. And uh, I have a colleague at, at, at UCSF uh, by the name of Laura Gottlieb, who's doing some really interesting work. Um, so she's a, she's a physician trained as a family doctor. And uh, a lot of her work is thinking about broadening the capacity of physicians to do more than simply prescribe medications, particularly when um, patients present with issues that reflect not simply a individual medical problem, but a structural inequality. So for example, if someone presents to a clinic, it, it seems like their biggest problem is food insecurity, um, then a doctor should be able to say, I'm gonna prescribe you, you know, two bags of groceries, right? Or if, uh, if, a, if, if a patient presents himself to a physician and they're complaining of health problems, and it's clear that their biggest problem is tied to the fact that they are, are unhoused, then a doctor should be able to, in a sense, quote unquote, prescribe housing uh, for a certain period of time to get someone on their feet. That is to say that many of the medical conditions that present in clinical settings are not something that can be treated with a pill or a certain type of medical examination, but it's about allowing someone the space to have access to resources that can put them in a position that can not only allow them to feel better and heal, but also to kind of regroup uh, so that they can then provide these resources for themselves, right? And so this is to say that I would, as we, one way to think about kind of integrating our understanding of the social determinants of health with the clinical um, interaction is to provide doctors the resources and the space and the ability to be able to detect when the greatest challenge that's facing someone is connected to their kind of social and political and economic positioning rather than any type of, you know, physiological problem that they're having. And that's something that I think we have to really do some research on this and expand this ability. And it, it probably involves a closer relationship between medical doctors and social workers, medical doctors and public health practitioners, and how do we kind of rethink the clinical interaction in a way that we have teams of people thinking about the best way to improve the health of folks. And so I, I think that, that that's one way to kind of rethink the clinical space. Uh, in terms of rethinking our understanding of race, um, you know, I, um, you know, medicine is such a fascinating field. You know, I'm not trained as a physician, but I understand many of the pressures that physicians often have. Um, for, so most clinical actions last, last, you know, less than 10 or 15 minutes. You're often in high pressure environments. You often have to make, uh, you know, quick decisions uh, with limited resources and information. And in that context, you know, race can become a proxy. It's a shorthand for thinking about what might be ailing someone. And so um, I think one way to make sure that race is used productively in clinical settings is to create a set of conditions and norms that allows doctors to slow down, um, that kind of decreases the external pressures on the clinical interaction, and simply give doctors the time to be more mindful about an individual patient in a way where there's less need to use race as a proxy in understanding their health outcomes and allows them to seriously think through at an individual level some of the problems that might be affecting someone. And so again, that's much more of a structural transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and, but at the same time, I think just that's one kind of way in which we can just put physicians in a position where they can be better doctors um, by changing some of the, the pressures around them. Great. Fatima, do you have, do you have thoughts on that question? In the... no, I think well, I think he answered it really well. Um, I think the, um, the only thing is thinking about institutionalizing how we would do this. So the idea of really bringing together very intentionally different stakeholders in the community to work with the clinical, you know, with healthcare networks to basically make this happen. Mm -hmm. So if a patient does present with food insecurity, the doctor immediately knows where they would then refer that patient and then be able to follow up with that patient. So it's not just a one stop and you come and go, but really follow up with them and have a kind of a long-term relationship to make sure that 
their, you know, their situation at home is actually improving and then following up to see how health is improving. Um, and then I would also say we have to think really, you know, proactively and really upstream and think about how do we also bring communities of color into medical spaces, right? And bringing their voices in so that we can learn more about these things just from people actually being in the field and, and, and bringing community voices into medical field, um, you know, from the beginning, instead of just kind of doing that kind of, um, you know, once a, in being reactive, like once a problem occurs, then we reach out to the community. But really, you know, I think healthcare networks, physicians and social workers and the public health you know, officials really need to come together and bring, bring in, you know, diversify the workforce essentially, just to make sure these voices are already there. Mm -hmm. you know, they're being heard and, you know, things that may, you know, are gonna come up from these conversations are gonna be so rich and important in terms of informing uh, physicians care patients. It's a great, great observation, and it's a great segue to the next question, which uh, one of our audience members um, talked about. Um, you know, any advice you you can share, um, either of you, on um, encouraging uh, students of color to uh, remain in STEM fields? Um, you know, sort of citing some citing some evidence that uh, that currently students of color are entering STEM fields at a greater rate, but are also then uh, dropping out at higher rates. And so if we have a, you know, if we can see the, the good of keeping um, of, of students of color in the field for all sorts of reasons, um, what are practices you can share with some of our audience members, might be faculty at the university, your teachers of secondary uh, education, K through 12 teachers um, on, on encouraging, um, encouraging persistence in, 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 in these fields. In addition to studying bioethics as well, Dr. Osagagi, but uh, um, how, how, do we, how do we also encourage persistence in these fields? Any thoughts? Yeah, this is such a tricky question, <laughs> and uh, it's tricky because it's a chicken and egg problem. Uh, so, you know, lots of folks have shown that success, particularly in the STEM fields, requires mentorship um, and requires, you know, faculty investing in students to make sure that they can see themselves going down the path of success. I think this gets complicated because so many of the STEM, so many, so many, um, or I should say, so much of STEM faculties is uh, occupied by people who are not of color and they're not very diverse. Um, and so it creates this loop where because the faculties are not diverse, that these faculties are often not attentive to the needs of students of color and then students of color fall through the crack and they feel unsupported and then they drop out. And so, and the only way you fix that is by getting students of color through the process so that they can become part of the faculty that can then attract more students, right? And so where do you intervene? So this is where I think it's important to take radical measures and non-traditional measures. Um, and by radical, I mean that we have to think outside the box and provide incentives for faculty members to pay particular attention to the needs of students of color, uh, particularly first-generation students who may not be aware of what is necessarily needed to succeed in STEM fields. Um, so, for example, um, you know, I, I was uh, I um, at Berkeley. I was um, I, I was able to, in a sense. Uh, see some of the um, some we had uh, we were hiring for a couple of, of new faculty members in the school of public health and you know one question that we ask is that we ask all applicants to describe their mentoring and in particular their successes they've had with mentoring diverse students so women and people of color and I think that is a fantastic question to ask and it's a question that should be taken seriously because when we hire um, new faculty, you know, it not only do we need to hire a diverse faculty, but we need to hire faculty who have experience with working with women and people of color and helping them be successful. And I would like to see that become, uh, I, I'd like to see that question be higher up on a priority level in terms of what matters when we start hiring new people, uh, not only at Berkeley, but across the board. That is to say, we really need to make sure that when people start thinking about having academic careers and they're not persons of color or not women, that they understand the importance of being able to work with diverse groups and they don't simply support people who look like them or come from a similar background. And so I think universities need to find creative ways to have that incentive, right? So if there are faculty members who have repeated successes in um, helping to graduate and helping uh, uh, students of color and women succeed in STEM faculties, they should be financially compensated, right? To me, that is as significant as placing several articles in top journals, right? Um, I would say it's even more significant. 
And conversely, if we have faculty members that consistently lack diversity in their research labs or their ability to, in a sense, promote, um, promote the, uh, um, <clears throat> or the, I should say lack diversity in their promotion of students and in terms of who gets through and graduates, if there are faculty who are not succeeding, well, they should probably have, be having conversations with their dean about what they're not doing correctly, uh, akin to if a faculty member was not succeeding in other areas of research or teaching. So this is to say we really have to take this issue, issue of diversity seriously as a foundational aspect of what it means to be a scholar at a university. Um, and um, I think if universities can create the right incentives, we can we can fix this. That's well said. In fact, I know this is an area of interest for yours as well. Do you have any any further advice for uh, uh, our audience on this question? Well, he actually stole all of my words. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would say diversify the faculty. Um, and then also just, you know, diversifying the faculty and then making, you know, the tenure promotion guidelines, you know, going along with that to retain faculty, right? I've noticed, and I'm, you know, there's a lot of literature that a lot of faculty of color join and then they don't stay in institutions, right. um, especially research heavy institutions. So how do we then mentor those faculty and how keep them, you know, keep them, you know, in the institution and then of course bring in students of color. Um, and I was also just going to add that, you know, thinking about the general university and the sense of community within the university is something else to, you know, that's just apart from faculty. And, you know, I think a lot of students join, but they don't stay because they don't necessarily have that sense of belonging. You know, this isn't a place where, you know, people are really, I can, I feel comfortable, you know, hanging out with other, other students. So really also thinking about that experience, that student experience, and how do we make that really more palatable for students of color? And you know, making it more enjoyable, you know, for everybody. So, and making it more equitable. So, I think that's another aspect that you know, from the university point of view, that we could work on. Right, and not and, to disproportionately burden, you know, uh, faculty of color with, with yes. that role, without without you know, in a way that further disadvantages them in a scholarly intensive environment. Yes. Um, you know, I, I appreciate. I, mean, both, I think both of those comments are really helpful, and um, you know, for allies who are trying trying to play a role in this too. I think you know, one. One thread I heard heard you say that connects, I think, your advice to doctors and your advice to uh, faculty and mentors is, you know, slow down a little bit, right, and get to know the people who are in front of you, um, and right. you know, uh, not operating under under broad assumptions, but also being aware of dif differential impacts of of what what you do and what are your goals um, for for equity. But another uh, no, another another question, um, slightly slightly different angle here, but um, this question says um, talks about big data. And the um, capacity, the potential for um, positive and negative impact for uh, big data to influence health inequities. So um, I think there's a, and also the question asked, it says, uh, it seems like a moment to get a uh, consent for how our health data will be used. So it sounds like it's going in a couple of different directions there with the question. One is um, about, you know, uh, as technology and health intersect, and, you know, I just logged into my hospital portal and all my data seems out there for, you know, I'm sure in a secured environment, but you know, I think more and more of our data gets shared and, and we're uh, involved in sy systems that, that uh, use our data for all sorts of good reasons to predict and to, and to track and to and improve health outcomes. We also have some ethical questions about ownership of data. And so um, do you have, uh, can you share any thoughts you have on, on either how we can think about that either personally or institutionally around big data, ownership of data, personal data and personal health, things like that? Yeah, it, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it, it's such a profound problem, and um, you know who owns this data? Um, what happens when ownership is transferred? How are individuals able to track that? Um, it, it's a it's a tremendous problem, and how that data data is mined, and oftentimes the bigger question is how it might be mined in a way that can then reaffirm existing hierarchies in society. Um, so I think it's a tremendous problem that has to be looked at closely. Um, you know, I think the question around privacy is just the first question, right? The idea that um, individuals should be able to manage and control their data and what type of data goes to corporations um, or or healthcare industries. Uh, I think that, that, that's, that's the first question, but I think you know, we also have to ask deeper questions of why people are asking the quest certain questions in the first place. So, you know, you know, we've all had the experience where, you know, we are, um, you know, answering health questions either in a doctor's office or or in other type of places. And 
it's not quite clear why a question is being asked or how it's relevant. And I think on the one hand, oftentimes, you know, these type of databases want to have as much information about us so that they can make connections between things that might seem unrelated. On the other hand, that creates more opportunity for, you know, aspects about ourselves and our, and our private lives to be uh, exposed. So, you know, I think we just have to be very intentional about the questions that we ask and their relevance and um, uh, making sure that the information that is collected is for the benefit of individual patients and not for the profitability of a uh, of an industry or, or a business. And I think that's where, you know, we just have to kind of keep our eye on in terms of what's in the patient's interest and what's being collected because it might be profitable down the line. Can you say a bit more about the, the first part? That was very helpful with the, the very first part of what you said, which is about, um, you know, the, some of the things around AI ethics, artificial intelligence ethics, and how we, um, how, you know, if you're, if you're mining data, you might be replicating sort of existing biases, prejudices, you know, some of the, some yeah. of the, systems that are learning how to, you know, learning English by scanning the web or picking up all the, you know, all the right. prejudices and all the, um, you know, language usage that, that, that shows up there and all the same kind of correlations and biases get baked into the yeah. AI on the other side. Is that showing up in health? I mean, is that, is that showing up in, in sort of health research and big data and health in ways that you're, you can comment on? Yeah. So I, so my sense is that it's showing up in how we understand which differences matter. And so, for example, if you're programming uh, an algorithm, in a way that is based upon existing social biases and their relevance, and that becomes part of the algorithm, then that's exactly what the algorithm is gonna spit back out on the back end, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is to say, we have to be very careful about how we understand human difference, how those differences are interpreted and then kind of analyzed through um, various programs and algorithms and making sure that we don't use algorithms as a way to, in a sense, um, Try to. We don't use algorithms as a way to reaffirm biases and give them a perception of kind of uh, neutrality because they are part of a computer program without acknowledging that the programs themselves often have code that are based upon our own kind of social biases themselves. So it's another way of saying that we tend to understand algorithmic decision making as a neutral assessment of the world. And this kind of ties back into the color blindness conversation we are having before. Mm -hmm. We tend to understand those outcomes of algorithms as simply being, well, this is what this is what the computer spit out. This is what the algorithm said. There's no bias here because no human was involved. And that's not true. Humans were involved in the construction of the entire enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. And there are ways in which those kind of subjective human understandings become part of the quote unquote objective assessment. And so we have to be mindful of that and making sure that again, that, that the kind of new, the perceived neutrality of algorithmic decision making isn't used to obscure the always present kind of human subjective um, interactions and experiences. Yeah, it's not another instance where the uh, you know the bioethical perspective is a critical one when we're talking about computer science and and, right. and uh, you know, d database analysis and all those kinds of things. And I, I appreciate really appreciate what you just said about the the sort of false sense of objectivity because it got generated by an algorithm and that, right. that uh, you, you forget what's what's baked into the process and uh, you want to be cautious about that as well um, one uh, one one last question from the field and then and then um, uh, we'll make a few comments and we'll wrap things up but um, this is a, again a sort of a structural question about the American healthcare system the question is is it possible to have a just American healthcare system that is profit driven uh, would universal health health care be a critical first step to ad addressing those structures that are actively harming community of color. Yes, that okay, is. Okay, that, 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 <laughs> that's neat. That's something I, I, I think is crucial, right? So it's, it's hard to square the idea of a just health system with one that is driven by profit because by definition, the profit-based system is more interested in uh, making money as opposed to the health outcomes of their patients. Now, that's not to say that these ideas are always mutually exclusive. Our existing healthcare system does do a, I think, a decent job uh, of taking care of people. The problem is that it's often at a cost that can be quite damaging to many folks and often not accessible to as many people who need it. And so the way we reduce costs and improve access is by removing the profit-based um, aspect of healthcare and we create a system that is truly accessible to all people um, and, and making sure that one's ability to participate is not based upon whether or not one has a job, but simply based upon being a human being. 
Fatima, any comments to follow up or any any closing questions for our, for our guest today? No, I just would say basically to add on to what he said, healthcare is a human right and then see, viewing it that way and it's not a privilege. It's something that everyone should have, right? Just really using that paradigm in order to, in, a, in a way to think about it. Yes, it's a radically simple idea. Yeah. You know, it's just, just something that we have to, be, we have to move towards. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing um, as a scholar and a member of uh, multiple academic communities um, to, to uh, push forward these ideas, um, for taking the time to share your thoughts uh, and expertise with us tonight. Um, Fatima, thank you for uh, your excellent questions. Um, you really, you both have presented um, everyone here today with a, with a, a fantastic uh, realm of ideas to think about. And I really appreciate uh, both the um, both the theoretical academic work and the call call to action. I think uh, is is really important. Um, I know as a as a university, we're um, always struggling with a lot of these same questions that, that you've brought up. I think we're not alone in that. Um, there's some some local local uh, challenges and some some common challenges. Um, I will say in closing that one one um, initiative that we've recently taken, our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, put a call out to our campus to uh, to come up with some some new ideas, things that we have been doing, uh, unearthing some uh, some areas of uh, potential, and one uh, one of the fronted the, Tying this back to the libraries, one of the one of the funded projects was to create a, an anti-racist reading room um, within our library, and um, that's something we're looking forward to um, to creating a, a, a space uh, for a continuity of these conversations when we can be more in person and more together uh, to do these. And I'll just close by saying that um, I can think of at least uh, three books that will be among the very first ones that we purchase. Uh, uh, we'll be honored to have your, your books in and, in and among our libraries. I know we have the digital versions already, but we'll, we'll get print books. Sometimes it's nice to be able to pick one up and, and sit down in a chair and, and read and talk about it. So uh, perhaps we'll get a chance to, to welcome you into that space, uh, into our libraries and into our campus sometime in the future. That'll be great. Thank you. you. If we were uh, if we were here together, I'm sure we would have a, a thunderous round of applause. But I'll just uh, we can just give you uh, at least at least two applauses. Um, uh, thank you again for your time tonight. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, and best of luck to you. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank right. you so much, Dr. Obasogi. Thank you. Take care. Yep. Thanks for our audience for being here. Yep. Everyone have a good night. Be safe.